Hey everyone, so this is the next discussion that's based off of the chapter 18 lecture, which is gas transport. So today I'll be talking about hemoglobin and the chemoreceptors that regulate ventilation. So if we look at our outline, uh, I have the topics that I'm going to go through. So like I said, I'll start by going over the hemoglobin saturation curve, and I'll talk about factors that affect a right and left shift and what those shifts mean. And then I'll talk about the respiratory chemoreceptor reflex. And then we'll talk about the physiology of static apnea world record, which is the world record for holding your breath underwater. Okay, so for hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is one of the oxygen carrying proteins in our body. It is found in our blood and this is the normal hemoglobin saturation curve. So on our x-axis we have we have PO2 which is partial pressure of O2, it's the concentration of oxygen in the body and on the y-axis we have the percent saturation so this is a percentage of saturation for hemoglobin. Alright so you'll notice on the x-axis that you have two kind of benchmarks on it. You have the alveoli and a resting cell at 40. So this graph, when I read it and interpret it, I usually start at the top and then work my way down. So I read this right to left rather than uh, left to right because I think it makes more sense because when in the process of respiration we start in the alveoli and then we go to the cells. So because that's the pathway that oxygen takes, I think it's easier to read this graph starting from the top. Okay, so um, on the x-axis, we have millimeters of mercury. This is not a percentage. It's just conveniently labeled from 0 to 100. But if we look at the alveoli, we have a really high concentration of oxygen. So hemoglobin at this point is nearly 100% saturated. It looks like it's maybe 97% saturated, but let's just consider this to be 100% saturated. And if you have um, studied hemoglobin before, maybe in biochem, you probably remember that hemoglobin has four binding sites. So if we consider this point to be 100% saturated, then hemoglobin has four out of the four binding sites um, of O2 bound. So it has four oxygens bound to its four binding sites, so 100% saturated. Okay, so hemoglobin uh, will pick up that oxygen in the alveoli and then it will be brought back to the left side of the heart where the left ventricle will pump it out into systemic circulation where it will start delivering oxygen to tissues. So if it starts traveling through the body, blood is going to be traveling through the body to systemic circulation, and it will be delivering oxygen along the way. So let's say it gets to a resting cell down here, and this can be any cell really in your body. Um, I usually think of these cells as muscle cells, so let's say this is just a resting muscle cell, so it's not contracting or anything, it's just at rest. So we see that by the time hemoglobin reaches the resting muscle cell, it is about 75% saturated. So if we were to stick with this uh, simplified version of hemoglobin saying that, okay, there's four binding sites. In the alveoli, it was 100% saturated, so it had four out of the four binding sites filled. Well, at the resting muscle cell, it's 75% saturated, so that means here there's three out of the four binding sites filled. So hemoglobin has let go of one oxygen to the resting muscle cell. So it has dropped off 25% of its oxygen. So this is how hemoglobin works under normal conditions. It delivers about 25% of the oxygen to your resting cells. So some factors can cause uh, a shift in this curve. So the first one we're going to look at is a right shift. 
So let's look at a right shift in this curve. All right, so that purple line I've drawn is the right shift. Maybe I should change color since everything else is in purple. All right, so let's look back at the alveoli. We noticed that at the alveoli, there's not much of a difference in percent saturation. Because the concentration of oxygen is so high in the lungs, hemoglobin is still nearly 100% saturated in the lungs with a right shift. So let's still consider this four out of four um, oxygen binding seats filled. So we see that hemoglobin, as it starts to travel through systemic circulation, so going down, and it gets to the resting cell, it's now 40% saturated. So if we trace this out to the y-axis, it's 40% saturated. So that means here it let go of 60% of all of the oxygen it was carrying. But up here, we saw that it only let go of 25% of all of the oxygen. So a right shift, a right shift in the hemoglobin saturation curve means there is a decreased affinity for oxygen. So you have a decreased affinity for oxygen. That means hemoglobin does not hold on to oxygen as tightly, so it's more willing to let go of oxygen. So we see that at the uh, resting cell in a right shift, it's let go of 60% of the oxygen, and that is more than the 25% that it let go during normal conditions. So things that could cause a right shift um, would, be, would be over here. So you have things that could cause a right shift would be an increased CO2 concentration in the blood. Um, increased temperature of the body, increased hydrogen concentration, which is the same as decreasing pH, because pH is the inverse log of hydrogen concentration. And then the fourth one is increased 2,3 dpg. So these four things can cause a right shift. And I wanted to talk about the 2,3 dpg. Um, Ian did mention this in lecture, but just as a reminder, dpg is a intermediate of glycolysis. So the concentration of 2,3 dpg in the body is going to be a marker of how much glycolysis is running in your body. So how much glucose you are breaking down through glycolysis specifically. And we typically think of glycolysis as anaerobic metabolism. So 2,3-DPG is a marker of how much anaerobic metabolism your body is going through. All right, so the other situation that we have is a left shift. So I'll draw that now. All right, so here we have the left shift. So we see that in the alveoli, again, essentially 100% saturated because there's such a high concentration of oxygen in the lungs. But we see here that at the resting tissue, it is now um, about 85% saturated. So compared to the normal saturation curve, so this is 85% saturated. Well, if it started at 100% saturated, that means it let go of only 15% of its oxygen. And we said that normally it lets go of 25% of its oxygen. So with the left shift, that means hemoglobin is not willing, or not as willing, to let go of its oxygen. So a left shift, A left shift means you have an increased affinity for oxygen. Hemoglobin is holding on to oxygen more tightly than it would normally.
which means the resting cell or your muscle cell doesn't get as much oxygen as it normally would. So the factors that can cause a left shift are really going to be the opposite of these. So a decreased CO2, a decreased temperature, decreased hydrogen concentration, which is a high pH, and then decreased 2,3 dPG. So this would be left shift, and on the right, I'm sorry, on the left would be the right shift. So blue is right shift, and in the kind of salmon color, it's left shift. So it's the exact opposite. All right, so those are the factors that can cause a right or left shift. So you need to know these four factors that cause the shift, and then what the shift actually means in terms of affinity for oxygen. So the right shift lets go of more oxygen. So right shifts are generally more beneficial for your uh, cells because the cells would be getting more oxygen when a right shift is happening. Whereas in a left shift, the cells or your muscle would not be getting as much oxygen. So the right shift is what naturally happens. This naturally happens during exercise. The right shift. Which is good because if you're exercising and your muscles are contracting a lot, that means they're producing a lot of metabolites. So they have a really high need or demand for oxygen. So if they need a really high amount of oxygen, then they will produce CO2, hydrogen, 2,3-DPG, and that will, that will signal hemoglobin to let go of more oxygen when it reaches the muscle. So the right shift is what naturally happens in your body when you exercise. All right, so that's all I had for the hemoglobin saturation. Now I wanted to move to the chemoreceptors and the chemoreceptor reflex. So I pulled this graph from um, the lecture. And so I'll just kind of briefly explain what's going on in here. So we have, uh, we have three chemoreceptors. We have CO2, O2, and pH. And pH is really sensing hydrogen ions. So we have peripheral and central chemoreceptors. Here is the central because it is in the medulla. So the medulla is in the brain, so this is your central nervous system. Hence, this is your central chemoreceptor. And then here we have peripheral. The peripheral chemoreceptors are in the carotid arteries and aortic arch, or the very beginning of the aorta, in the same places that your baroreceptors were found. So they are peripheral because they are outside of the central nervous system. Your carotid artery and aorta are not part of your central nervous system, but their neurons will link to the central nervous system. So they are outside of the brain and the spinal cord, so they are peripheral chemoreceptors. So your peripheral chemoreceptors respond to all three of these. They respond to CO2, O2, and hydrogen. So that's your peripheral chemoreceptors. But your central chemoreceptor only responds to CO2. So we see that with these chemoreceptors, they go to, uh, well, when the chemoreceptors sense these molecules, it sends that signal to the medulla. So let's say you had a high amount of CO2. Your medulla will sense that, and your carotid and aorta will sense the high CO2, and it will tell your RCC, your respiratory control center, that CO2 is too high. So if CO2 is too high in the body, then the goal should be to get CO2 back down. The way we do that is by increasing respiration. So we want to start to exhale and inhale more. So you will increase your ventilation rate. When you increase your ventilation rate, you will eventually blow off more CO2, which will finish this goal of decreasing CO2. So that's the chemoreceptor reflex. If you have a high CO2, the reflex is to get that CO2 back down. And we see that there's another side to this over here. 
and this is not part of the chemoreceptors, but it is still part of the RCC and respiratory control. So we see that emotions and voluntary control can work through your higher brain centers, which goes eventually to your RCC. So this is saying that your consciousness, your emotions, um, can also alter your respiratory rate. Like if you're really stressed, you might have an increased respiratory rate. Or you can voluntarily hold your breath, which will also uh, take control of your respiratory rate. In that case, it would stop your respiratory rate. So we see that we have um, the chemoreceptor control of respiration, but we also have the kind of consciousness or the conscious control of respiration because our higher brain centers can also act on the RCC. All right, so just to put this into a little bit more context, our normal PO2 levels in our arteries or our, our arterial blood is around 80 to 100 millimeters of mercury. And the normal PCO2 in our arterial blood is around 40 millimeters of mercury. So, whoops, I pulled these numbers from um, this chart that we talked about last week from the arterial blood. So the reason why I'm looking at arterial blood here is because our chemoreceptors are found in the arteries. They're found in the aorta and they're found in the carotid arteries. So this is the concentrate, the normal concentrations of oxygen and CO2 in our arterial blood. So this chemoreceptor reflex activates when PO2 is lower than 60 millimeters of mercury. So we see that our normal range is 80 to 100. So 60 is really low compared to our normal range. But if we have... Um, if we have really any any small deviation in our PCO2 where this goes too high or too low and that's going to be a very small window so really anything much higher than 40 or anything a little bit lower than 40 will trigger the chemoreceptor reflex but we see for oxygen the chemoreceptor reflex doesn't kick in until a pretty drastic drop in oxygen so normal CO2 Normal CO2 is kind of between like 38 and maybe 42 or maybe 45. So it's a pretty small window. So any deviation outside of this window will trigger the chemoreceptor reflex. So our body is much more sensitive to CO2 than it is to O2. So the main reason we breathe is to keep this level of CO2 within this range of 38 to about 42. That's why our average is about 40. So we breathe so that we can maintain our levels of CO2. And we are bringing in O2, but, but very rarely do we, in normal conditions, we rarely get under 60 millimeters of mercury. Getting that low in oxygen is usually due to maybe altitude or maybe some sort of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So in normal conditions, the chemoreceptor reflex is mainly triggered by CO2. All right, and then I have this here, I have this picture here of the RCC, which is kind of a review of what we had just talked about. Um, but we see here that uh, we have a few different nuclei here in the RCC that are responsible for controlling respiration. So we have the DRG, which is responsible for quiet breathing. So this is the breathing that you're doing right now. If you're just sitting down at rest, your DRG is making your inspiratory muscles like your diaphragm um, contract, and then the exhale is coming from the relaxation of your inspiratory muscles. And then the VRG is responsible for forced breathing. So this is like if you were to cough or if you were to uh, start to maybe hyperventilate, where you are more forcefully exhaling. But then we see here, again, just like last picture, that our higher brain centers, like our emotions and our voluntary control, our consciousness, can control our respiratory rate. Okay, so the reason why I'm talking about the RCC and the chemoreceptors is because this is the physiology behind 
um, static apnea. So, static apnea is fancy term for holding your breath and static because you're really not moving and apnea means you're not breathing. So I have this picture here of someone performing static apnea and they most often perform it in a pool face down because in a pool you don't have as much weight um, from gravity so you don't have to hold yourself up. So if you don't have to hold yourself up because you're floating in water, that means you can relax the muscles, like your postural muscles that you would be using to hold yourself up. The reason why you don't want to expend any energy is because if you are holding your breath for a long period of time, then you need to conserve all oxygen for your heart and your brain. And you don't want to be wasting that oxygen on muscle contractions like um, in your legs from standing. Um, okay, so most people do this in a pool face down. So when someone is lying face down and their face is exposed to cold water, and if they're holding their breath, then there's a physiological response called the mammalian dive reflex. So this occurs when your face, particularly your face, is submerged in cold water and if you are holding your breath. But the physiological response to this is, first, a pretty drastic drop in heart rate. So your heart rate can drop anywhere from maybe like 15 to 30 beats per minute once you submerge your face in cold water and hold your breath. The other thing we have is systemic vasoconstriction. So the systemic vasoconstriction means that you will have vasoconstriction in your arms, in your legs, um, in your GI tract, stuff like that. So you will have vasoconstriction everywhere. The reason why you need this systemic vasoconstriction is because it redistributes blood. So it redistributes blood primarily to your heart and your brain. So you have the decreased heart rate and then the systemic vasoconstriction that redistributes blood to your most vital organs like your heart and your brain. Okay, so this happens uh, when you are submerged in cold water and you are holding your breath. So with static apnea, um, this is the technique that people use when they are setting the world record for holding your breath, basically. So, the world record, um, it might be interesting if you can try to guess what the world record is. It has been set and broken many times, just like a lot of world records. Um, so maybe take like a second or two and try to guess how long you think the world record is for static apnea, for holding your breath underwater. All right, so we will get to the, uh, to the actual world record, but in 2008, David Blaine set the world record at 17 minutes and four seconds. So if you don't know who David Blaine is, um, he became famous for being like a street magician. <laughs> he had a show uh, a long time ago called Street Magic where he would basically just walk around streets um, and perform magic for people. But eventually he started doing, I guess, tricks or stunts where he would push his body to the physiological limit that he could. So in 2008, he decided that he wanted to hold his breath for as long as he possibly could and he wanted to break the world record. All right, so in 2008, he set it at 17 minutes and four seconds. So I know it's David Blaine and he's a magician and he basically fakes things, but he did actually perform this and he did actually do it. He used a trick and he did manipulate the physiology, but I'll explain how he did that. All right, so using, um, using the physiology behind kind of oxygen transport and chemoreceptors, he trained himself to hold his breath for so long. So the first thing he did 
is he spent four months not he spent months he spent four months uh, sleeping in a hypoxic tent so he slept in a tent that simulated high altitude for four months so based on what we know about altitude and altitude adaptations we know that sleeping in a hypoxic tent or exposure to hypoxia for a long period of time on the order of weeks and months we know that this secretes naturally secretes EPO into your blood and that that will increase your hematocrit which is your red blood cell count. So he increased his red blood cell count. By doing that, he increased his oxygen carrying capacity um, so that he could just have more oxygen circulating in his blood. And then he went through um, a pretty rigorous um, endurance exercise training regimen, and he um, went through a lot of respiratory muscle training. So on the day where he went to break his record or went to break the record, um, he did a few things with CO2 and O2. So before getting into the water, what he did is he hyperventilated um, for, I think about a minute. He hyperventilated for a little bit. So the hyperventilation that he did, um, he was trained to do this, but the hyperventilation, what it did is it got it got CO2 really, really low in his body. So he blew off all of the CO2 in his body. And at the same time, he brought in oxygen. But after he hyperventilated, he breathed in pure oxygen. So he was hooked up to an oxygen tank and an oxygen mask where he breathed in pure oxygen. So we know that the chemoreceptor reflex will kick in if CO2... Um, if it gets too high, the chemoreceptor reflex will kick in. And when it kicks in, the response is to breathe. Like you want to get that CO2 out of your body. So you need to breathe when CO2 gets too high. All right, so by blowing off CO2, he got his CO2 really low and got his O2 really high. Because once you hold your breath, your body will start consuming O2 and producing CO2. So if he's holding his breath, but he has manipulated these, then he is hoping that he got O2 so high and CO2 so low that he can avoid the onset of the chemoreceptor reflex. However, at some point, um, these gases will start to start to accumulate, like CO2 will start to accumulate no matter what. So once CO2 starts to accumulate, around 10 minutes or so, um, these people get really bad abdominal pain because they get the urge to breathe. So their, uh, their respiratory control center is sensing this high amount of CO2 and it's telling the inspiratory muscles to contract and the expiratory muscles to contract. So they get really bad abdominal pains or kind of around 10 minutes of holding their breath. And that's because of the urge to breathe. So it gets really interesting because it becomes this battle of what is going to control your res your respiration? Is it going to be your RCC doing it um, based off your chemoreceptors, or is it going to be your consciousness, your voluntary control? And it seems like your voluntary control can win out, basically. Um, it can win out because if this starts to happen around 10 minutes, well, David Blaine went to 17 minutes. So he was able to fight this for at least seven minutes. Um, so it was really interesting. This is how he did it, by breathing in pure oxygen and exhaling all of the CO2. By manip So he manipulated the chemoreceptors, and he hoped to prolong the onset of the chemoreceptor reflex as long as possible. So it was really interesting. Um, I highly recommend looking into this. He was also connected to an EKG and a heart rate monitor during this entire thing. Um, so it's interesting to see how his heart rate changes and how the EKG changes during this. Um, he did do it on the Oprah show because it's David Blaine and he wanted the publicity. Um, but he did actually do it. Of course, he did use this trick of manipulating the chemoreceptors. So this is back in 2008, 17 minutes. So now in 2020, you can probably imagine that this world record has been broken.
So in 2017, Swedish freediver Aleš Seguda set the world record at 24 minutes and 3 seconds. And I definitely looked up how to pronounce his name. Um, but he did set it um, at 24 minutes, which is pretty ridiculous. And he used the same technique that David Blaine did. Um, it's this practice technique of purging the lungs of CO2 and packing them with O2. So they are able to breathe pure oxygen before going into holding their breath. Um, now, Leish Seguda is a trained free diver, so th the things that made him reach 24 minutes, uh, which was past David Blaine's 17 minutes, is probably genetics for one, the bigger lung capacity, but also he's been more trained in this. David Blaine only trained for about four months um, before he did it. So it's pretty incredible how these people can hold their breath. Now they are breathing in pure oxygen before going into the water. The world record without breathing in pure oxygen is about 11 minutes, which is still very ridiculous. Um, being able to hold your breath with, for 11 minutes without breathing in pure oxygen is is really, really amazing. Um, but So we see that these people are really pushing their physiology to the limits by manipulating their chemoreceptor reflex. So of course, um, we're not going to test you on David Blaine and, and how he was able to hold his breath, but we will test you on the chemoreceptor reflex, where the chemoreceptors are found, what they respond to, things like that, what controls respiration, and, and normal arterial uh, blood gas values. So that's all I have for today's uh, discussion. I hope you all enjoyed the um, learning the physiology behind how these people are able to hold their breath for so long. There is a TED talk that David Blaine did on this. It's about 20 minutes, but it is really, really interesting to listen to. Um, or if you even want to look up stuff that Aleish did, it is really interesting to learn um, how they're able to push their body to these limits. So I will be releasing um, another video soon, uh, at some point this week, about respiratory pathologies, so I will send out an announcement for that.